Welcome to Treasure Valley Podcast. I'm Chuck. Today's episode is brought to you by Lower Gentry Studios. Lower Gentry Studios has a new web series that you can catch the first episode of right now. It is called Canyon County. Look it up on YouTube. Um, Today I sit down with Tate Mason. Tate Mason is the director of the World Center for Birds of Prey right here in the Treasure Valley in Idaho. We talk about birds of prey, obviously. We talk about birds. We talk about the crows in Nampa. We also uh, talk about what you can do um, for habitat conservation. Enjoy. And we're on. All right. Welcome, Tate. Good to be here. Um, so we were just talking before we hit the record button about mm-hmm. um, your various positions here in the Treasure Valley. Um, right. you, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Because I'm excited to talk about birds. I'm excited to talk about birds of prey. Sure. But we need to make sure that you are vetted and an expert. We'll take your word for it, though. <laughs> Absolutely. So for, so first and foremost, I am the uh, husband of Beth Mason. Okay. And uh, that that is my most important role. Okay. Uh, but then for work... I am the director of the World Center for Birds of Prey, and uh, that is uh, the headquarters of the Peregrine Fund, is the World Center for Birds of Prey. And our local campus here in South Boise is about 580 acres, and um, that is where we manage projects all over the world. And my direct role is to manage the campus here in South Boise. Okay. And that is kind of interesting that uh, Idaho has the World Center for Birds of Prey Museum. And I have a feeling that has to do with the history of the Peregrine Falcon. Is right. that, w- w- did that exist before the, the, the success with the bringing back of the Peregrine Falcon or what? So let me just, the, the beginning of the Peregrine Fund was back even before 1970, although we officially uh, incorporated as a nonprofit in, in, I think it was October of 1970. And at that time, the Peregrine Falcon was down to 39 pairs in the United States, oh, all wow. west of the Mississippi, and or at least in the continental United States. The, the Falcon, the Peregrine Falcon was sliding toward extinction. Okay. And really it was there was a large effort underway to keep that from happening. A few years before that, I believe in 62, Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. And that is largely credited with sparking the modern environmental movement. And the way that I look at that is really humans came around to looking at themselves as as if we should not push other species off planet Earth. Okay. Intentionally or otherwise. And the peregrine falcon was really the first test case. So here we have the fastest creature on planet Earth, a globally distributed bird, and it's on its way out. Why? At the time in the early 60s, uh, pesticides were starting to be implicated. And it turns out that DDT was the reason that the peregrine falcon and other raptors were on their way to extinction. Now, the peregrine fund started as a captive breeding program for falcons. And so Dr. Tom Cade and his colleagues and students, he was a professor at Cornell's Lab of Ornithology in New York. They started raising peregrines and they had the idea that they could prevent this species from going extinct while they, in order to give humanity enough time to, to um, make the decisions about the reason for the bird being in trouble in the first place, which was the pesticide. And so they did that. And over the years, they raised over 4,000 peregrine falcons, released them back into the wild, and uh, were largely credited with recovering that species, one of the most successful conservation stories of all time. Of course, the recovery of the bald eagle, I mean, the bald eagle recovery happened because of the groundwork that was laid for the recovery of the peregrine falcon. And the bald eagle uh, came off the endangered species list in 2007. And so a couple of very charismatic creatures that, uh, that were saved because people looked at what the problem was, dealt with it, and, uh, you know, we've got a healthier landscape because of it. And, and so the peregrine was one of the first birds then to ever go through this this sure. process of the top down um, the first you know, the, the first top birds down of prey. crash <laughs> the first birds of prey that were listed were the bald eagle the the uh, peregrine falcon and the California condor okay and and the and the peregrine fund 
In 1970, we became an independent nonprofit organization that was dedicated to the conservation of birds of prey. And that, that mission uh, really took on a global focus. So our mission is the conservation of birds of prey worldwide. Um, the first bird we worked with was the peregrine falcon. But just three years later, we got involved with the Mauritius kestrel. The Maurit Mauritius kestrel in the Indian Ocean on the island of Mauritius got down to four individual birds. There were oh, wow. four of them left. And they were brought back, and by 1994, there were 800 of them, and they were taken off the endangered species list. So that sounds like a pretty large endeavor. Uh, what what goes into bringing a species back? Because obviously there's, if that's the, if you have figured out a model, there are obviously a lot of concerns, I, I believe, in the oceans. I mean, I just watched the newest on Netflix, they, they did uh, the, the Blue Planet 2 I don't know if you've seen that yet, but I it was, seen it yet. yeah, it's a little, I mean, obviously they point out a lot of the issues that are going on with our oceans and, and there's, seems like there's just kind of like zero accountability on the, in the yeah, oceans in, the in general. Cause it's like, well, we don't see it anymore. It's not in our cities. So mm -hmm. where does it go? We don't necessarily care. Um, what goes into, to, to bringing a species back? And then how do you, how, to me, the, the interesting fact about those, those four birds is how do you make sure that that you take care of that there isn't too much uh, recessive genetics mm -hmm. being uh, right. uh, spread throughout so, the species. Yeah, so the genetic issue is always going to be there in populations where there are not very many individuals left. Yeah. You can scoot that microphone closer to you. Too, that that really just becomes a, that is a, a factor mm -hmm. that, that you either have to deal with or you have to somewhat ignore and just okay. go ahead and say, we're going to save this species anyway. And, you know, for example, if there are four left and there's a major genetic defect in one of those four and you inbreed it over and over again, mm -hmm. it could spell the end of the species. But the end of the species was imminent anyway at that point, right? And so what we've looked at doing is um, – starting captive breeding program, which has been very effectively for saving, uh, saving birds of prey. Take, a, take the California condor, for example. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. The condor was down to 22 individual species, or 22 individual birds uh, in 1987 or so. Um, they, the birds were dying in the wild so fast that people could see the end for the species. And so the first thing... What was, I guess, hap what was happening to them? I wouldn't say the first thing. Um, so I'll get to that. Let, let, okay. me take, let, me take it, let me take this a little bit more uh, from a broader perspective. So at the time when there were only maybe 27 or 30 or even 40 of these condors left, people still didn't know why they were disappearing. Hmm. And so such a crucial part to affecting a recovery is really understanding the problem. And that is a hallmark of the Peregrine Fund is that we use science to determine what the problem is. Um, we don't use hunches or this is what I think it's going to be. Um, that's but, probably a good way to address act this <laughs> in and, general and, for and, anybody. But with the condor, yeah. there, there really wasn't, um, there wasn't a, a definitive answer as to why. They saw condors that were starving, for example. And so it's pretty easy to think, well, there's just not enough food out there, right? If you see starving birds, let's feed them more. Yeah. And so early uh, biologists were feeding these condors and they would feed them, you know, dead cows or something like that. Sometimes they shoot the cow with a lead bullet. Oh, nice. Now, turns out that it's the lead that the condors are having trouble with. So they're eating spent lead ammunition out of animals that have been shot. And the lead gets into their blood, causes lead toxicosis, and it makes it so essentially their neurological functioning breaks down. And they, even if they are have food in their crop, which is, you know, where they hold their food in their neck, they can't push that down into their stomach because their brain isn't functioning right. Wow. And so they can starve even if the food's available. And so that was the original, that was the cause, was was the lead? Well, the lead poisoning is what we think. Now, okay. by 1987, every condor was out of the wild. So getting back to how do you save a species, sometimes you need to take it out of the environment. Hmm. You know, that's a very drastic thing. And, I, and at the time, 
that wasn't universally agreed upon as the right step. Take every single condor out of the wild because then the, the species was functionally extinct in the wild. It only existed in zoos at that point. And there are other species that are in the same predicament. Um, but if you think about it, this is North America's largest bird. This is, the, this is our, our <clears throat> nine and a half foot wingspan condor. Yeah. An and epic bird of Western North America. And <clears throat> every single one of them lived in zoos. So we started... And by we, I kind of mean humanity because the Peregrine Fund did not start the captive breeding for the condors. That was done by Los Angeles and San Diego zoos. So they, they start a captive population. Now you can go back and say, why did the species disappear? And it's very hard to test hypotheses when, the there's, environment. when there's no more birds out in the environment. Yeah. Right? There's no birds in the landscape. One of the last birds that they had captured or at least one of the last birds that had died before the last of the birds were captured. Uh, they did a, le- a, a blood test on it, and they found that that bird had died of lead poisoning. And then they, so they really had one individual that had died of lead poisoning. Could you go back and say, oh, the birds that died in the 1950s also died of lead poisoning? Or how about the birds that died in the 1890s or even before that? It's really hard to kind of retroactively mm-hmm. assign blame uh, with, with uh, that kind of evidence. So my my uh, friends and I joke about that because uh, – so, so my background's in psychology and obviously like uh, psychology as a science – the statistical significance is a much different thing than if you're doing the statistical significance of a chemistry reaction, you know? Right. And so I imagine in biology that it's, 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 it's a little bit closer on some of the extremes on that bell curve, but we always joke around about the N of one. Like, what do you think happened? Oh, it's, you know, it's this, this, and this. Well, my N is one. So in statistics, like if you have one sample, like you can't necessarily yeah. draw anything out of that. You need to have can't I have think it's like many, like 25 or 50 is usually it's better if it's at least 100 people or 100 samples. Right. Um, but So uh, at that point, there really wasn't any conclusive evidence as to why the condor was in the predicament that it was in. But mm-hmm. then you go through the 1980s and 1990s and the condors are just in zoos. But fortunately, captive breeding for the species worked. So they started making more of themselves in captivity. And then by 1993, releases were underway. And then you have the ability to test hypotheses, you know, for a, so hypothesis, just an explanation for something that we see out there. Uh, and is lead poisoning the problem? Um, we can test that. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that was happening is they were uh, putting transmitters on all the birds that they were releasing into the wild. And if the bird died, determine why. And that's when we started just time and time again figuring out that lead was the problem and so that because they were dying of lead poisoning and uh, so by about 2008 there wasn't really any more question about that Uh, that if we believe that if that one environmental stressor could be taken care of the condor will recover the condor will recover across the west it's not that there's not enough prey for them there's plenty of prey Hmm. out there on the landscape we just need to keep the toxin out of their food and the toxin is lead. How, so, so that's gotta be interesting The all the ethics that are involved in what you do. And, and you, you talking about in the sixties, there was one book that seemed to spark that, uh, that drive to, instead of unquestioningly move ahead as humans and invading these areas and not thinking long term in mm-hmm. what we're doing, and maybe it's 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 because there's just so much space and so much land available, and I think about the oceans as well. Um, right. Um, well, and, and and draw a parallel to the peregrine falcon recovery, and at that point in the early 1970s, I had mentioned there were 39 pairs of known pairs of peregrines left in the continental United States, and at that point DDT had been adopted so uh, so widespread uh, that you know some some people were even called it, calling it a war on bugs mm-hmm. you know we're out there and taking care of insects and it turns out that the birds are eating the insects 
And so if we use something that is so toxic on the insects themselves that it affects the birds, then we are taking out nature's insect control. And that was one of the things that Rachel Carson highlighted in her book is just kind of the short sightedness of that. So when the insects evolve the resistance to the pesticide and we've taken out the birds, the insects are going to win that game in the long run. Yes, because, yeah, and and that that top down processing and the longevity. I like how you point that out. Uh, What's a sustainable solution to the problem? Because we always try to solve problems and and try to do it as inexpensively as possible. I I feel like that's kind of how I... (laughs) As as a society, I'm not sure we do it that way. Individually, perhaps. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of variability, but um, if there's infinite space and and, and seemingly infinite space and and mm -hmm. infinite resources, sometimes we just try to nip things in the bud without thinking the the long-term effects. And chemicals are such an... Such an interesting one, too, because, I mean, obviously they're very effective, but the history of chemistry in, in general is just they've known a lot of different things and, and uh, ways that different chemicals react and, and, and can give us a solution to problems, mm-hmm. um, but then not necessarily understanding how that affects animals, because if something's tested on a human and it's totally safe for us or, you know, they don't run into a lot of issues with it, it doesn't necessarily right. make it's safe for animals and their toxic level yeah, might and, be a different... and birds are quite a bit different than mammals. Yes. And, and, and that's exactly what we found out with DDT is that DDT would get into the eggshell of the bird and oh. cause, the, cause eggshell thinning. So really DDT in particular uh, worked like birth control for birds. Interesting. So they couldn't have young. 30 years of not having young in a species is on its way out. Wow. Wow. So um, how do you recommend uh, people that are interested in conservation, what do you recommend that they do um, to help out? What are some of the, the easiest things that, that people can do on like a, like a daily sure. basis, like functional? So on a, on a daily basis, I think that we look at our own landscapes, where we live, and we look at paying attention to what's there. So one of the things that I've done in my, in my trajectory, and of course I got into birds, but I'm also really into plants and, and into, I'm into all kinds of things, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but in... Were you going to say entomology? Well, I was, you know, entomology, of course, too. It's like, okay. it's, it's just all connected. Yeah. And the more you pull on one thing, the more you find everything else. I actually just read uh, uh, Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene like, oh, sure. over the summer. And to me, it was super eye-opening book um, just because of the the connection between that and psychology mm-hmm. and it's like the 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 stepping stone between like biology and chemistry and psychology but anyway yeah, he, he brings up a lot of really cool s- studies about uh, ants and and uh, social insects but anyway sorry right what, what we can do um, as, a spe- it- as as individuals. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the your your local environment. Pay mm-hmm. attention. That's the first thing. What's out there? You know, what birds are out there? Uh, it could be what insects, what plants, and then improve that. You know, uh, one of the things that I notice is uh, biodiversity. If mm-hmm. there's a diversity of birds. So, for example, if you just have crows. And nothing else like nothing else but crows. Yeah. For example, like if you live in Nampa. Yes. And I was going to ask you about that too. <laughs> then uh, you might ask why, uh-huh. and you might uh, notice that in areas that have a little bit more, um, uh, for lack of a better word, maybe a robust nature, uh, park, natural areas and parks, uh, areas with plants that are that are native to the area, and then you'll see a different a different assemblage of birds. Uh, and, and you'll notice that if you go out, um, if you go out into the sagebrush right outside of town and you just see a completely different assemblage of birds than we'll see in, in our, especially our, maybe our more manicured neighborhoods that are really well kept. So just, um, there's a bike path right in my neighborhood and it's full of mallards, just mm-hmm. chock full of mallards and they don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously everybody feeds them and i i mean i i don't see them leave i mean they're here right, right now so they're obviously and they're here in the summertime mm-hmm. so they're not migrating no. so that that actual that instinct of theirs to migrate is completely gone so i'm i'm assuming that that's probably squeezing out 
or maybe yeah, is it I'm necessarily because they're sure getting bred from? I'm not sure that mallards are migratory. So, are they so mallards okay. are going to be here year round, okay. regardless. Now, now a Canada goose, on the other hand, okay. historically was migratory, and now that we've opened up so much habitat for them, which and habitat for mallards too, which is open um, turf grass. Mm-hmm. You know, we as humans create a lot of turf grass, okay. and that is great habitat for a goose. So it shouldn't be a surprise when we go to a park and we see a whole lot of geese. And of course, people get unhappy because the geese are defecating all over the park. Yes. And nobody wants to walk around through that. Um, but to and me, and clean it. If it's a dog, they can look at the owner and be like, "Hey, you're a jerk." <laughs> but when it's just a goose that's like wandering around in the neighborhood, you can't blame the goose. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it's hard to blame the goose when we created goose yeah. habitat. Yeah. You know, and and we create the habitats that um, you know that surround us. And so if humans are more intentional about the habitats that we create okay. and we create habitats that will support a greater level of biodiversity of plants, of insects, of birds, then I think we have a much richer landscape and we're, and we're really doing something for conservation. Okay. So, so like that might be something like uh, for That's my a- yard, which I, you saw it up. I try to put as much rock in there. It's also lower maintenance for me. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> then maybe you rip- get a couple lizards living out there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> or I'll, I'll get our ducks. Although I did have a falcon one year because I have this duck that uh, comes in every year. Um, I try to catch it, you know, because I feel bad when they hatch with the ducklings. I got a fenced in backyard. And so mm-hmm. this duck every year comes in and then she hides somewhere new in my backyard, lay some eggs, and then I'll have to try to catch her with her uh, group of ducklings and she won't leave them. Yeah, but you trying know, to get them to water. Yeah, but trying to get them to water. And then she just ends up walking in a circle yeah, <laughs> in mal- my backyard. And so like one day I, there was a falcon just sitting on my fence. <laughs> and then the next day, like there was no duck, mallards duck. are Mallards are peculiar. Yeah. And there are a number of species out there like mallards, um, house sparrows come to mind, um, that live and thrive in close proximity to humans. You know, they like the landscapes that we build. Mm-hmm. And those sorts of species are oftentimes going to be cosmopolitan or found all over um, found Cor- all over the world. Corvids. Yeah, corvids. Or if you the house sparrow that I just brought up. Mm-hmm. Um, a little sparrow that you could be in downtown Rome or downtown Quito, Ecuador, or downtown Boise, and the same species is flying around pulling chips off your table, yeah. you know, as you're sitting there drinking your coffee wherever you are anywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. On one level, that's interesting. Yeah, on another level, it's troubling. It's an English sparrow. It's a you know a, the house sparrow is also okay. called an English sparrow, and um, and so you know you see those same species showing up, but then you walk just out of town or into a healthy park, and then you find the birds that are from there, the native species, and and to me that's where the real gold is. And can you talk a little bit about the crows and why they're in Nampa? I was, I'm really curious about that because every single year when I see them, they're, they're right at the Fred Meyer that I shop at. Sure. And they're just, it's, I mean, obviously like we have a, a, a thing about, for some reason, I feel like there's certain people that are afraid of, of birds and it's, I don't know if, if Hitchcock hit on something or if he created something. No, <laughs> I, I think there are, there's a lot of people out there that are afraid of birds and usually that that stems from some childhood experience that was negative with birds. For example, like if you come up to a chicken coop Mm -hmm. and then somebody throws you in a chicken coop when you're a kid Mm -hmm. and the chickens all go crazy around you and you're just panicked to get out, you know, and you forget where the door is or something. And that person's going to be afraid of birds for the rest of their lives usually. And so I I think a a fear of birds is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think that maybe it's a little bit more cliche to be afraid of crows yeah. uh, because, I mean, they are black, a little bit yeah. like a black cat, you know. And, 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 they, the, and they look ominous when they are, there's, are, it has to be thousands of them just yeah. all in the trees. So, in so the... C- communal roosting in crows is not uncommon and it's not limited, limited to Nampa either. Mm. It, there's, there are different places around um really around North America, where the crows are doing this. Uh, and typically it's wintertime where they, none of them are nesting. Mm-hmm. And they, I, well, well, let me qualify this by saying I'm not a pro- professional crow biologist. Okay. And so I'm, I'm just giving you my understanding of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and they could seek protection by being in large groups. 
uh, because, um, you know, for example, the only thing that really comes after crows might be like you said, a falcon or a hawk or maybe a, a large owl, great horned owl. More commonly even would be a house cat or something like that. But when you get numbers, mm-hmm. then those predators are typically going to stay a little bit further away. Okay. And because if the the predator's seen, the crows all start making noise. They're all on alert. Crows are really smart to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the most intelligent birds that are out there. And some of the most intelligent animals that are out there as well. And yeah, I was going to ask ask you about that the, too, because like people don't uh, a lot a lot of people don't realize that because there's that cliche that bird brain cliche. Right. But there are several birds that are capable of puzzle solving. I was yeah. watching a documentary yeah, about that. Yeah, and crows in particular, they're they're known maybe not necessarily the Amer the the American crow, uh, but there is a crow that's been known to you know has been seen using tools to uh you know to get food out of a particular paradigm like a puzzle or yeah. something like that. And so yeah, the crows are the crows are problem solvers and um and, and they are very intelligent. They're finding some benefit by all roosting together, mm-hmm. you know, until uh until animal control comes or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because the neighbors are so unhappy with it. There's so many ominous crows staring yeah. them down in their houses. Yeah. So that's it, just a natural so so they it, would It's it's natural, yeah. They would be do that be doing that anyway. We just they just happen to be doing it in our neighborhood and they would Right. If we got them, if for some reason we got to, I, were able to shoo them away, they would just I do it think somewhere else. So. Now, I'm not, like I said, I'm not 100% sure on that. Mm-hmm. You know, like as far as are they doing that out, you know, just in, in the countryside somewhere? Are they also having communal roost there? Or is this more of a suburban phenomenon? That'd be a good question uh, to look into. And I can't say that I know the answer to that. Okay. Because the, the examples of this that I can think of are more in suburban or, or even urban areas. Well, there's also the food resources that would be readily available. Yeah, that's where you see that's where you see more crows. Yeah. They're, they're, yeah, I was watching, um, they're one of the few animals, like you had said, like the sparrow, um, and then like mice and, and rats mm-hmm. that just kind of follow humans yeah, around yeah. no matter where we go. You so can perhaps they're really, they're really not in the rural areas because there's not really that many crows out there. Yeah. They don't live at that high concentration outside of city areas. Can yeah, you, that's interesting. Can you talk a little bit about bird intelligence? I'm kind of curious about that and, and if you can enlighten me in, in any way along that. Because obviously there – and I wanted to ask you about the, the evolutionary link between birds and dinosaurs if you know anything about that sure. as well. Because I feel like those are kind of interrelated. We obviously – our nearest relative is a really long time ago. <laughs> but uh, birds um, – obviously mammals have like a social uh, – uh, uh, social propensity and some birds, some groups of birds have that very strong social propensity sure as well. Too. And they kind of mm-hmm. evolved a, a, intelligence, almost like a dolphin or a chimpanzee. Right. So bird and birds are, are reasonably intelligent in some clades of birds, like the, like the corvids, mm-hmm. um, you know, and the jays, the magpies fall into that group okay. too. They're, they're really pretty smart birds. Uh, there are a lot of birds that are not known for their intelligence. Yes. <laughs> chickens come to Dodo. mind. Dodo, yeah, chickens. <laughs> um, you, you know, and and even owls. You know, there's mm. that adage, wise as an owl. I don't think that comes from the that owls actually being wise. Owls have very forward-facing eyes. Owls are very patient. And humans associate patience with wisdom. So if you see this large-eyed creature just sitting there looks like it's pondering something yeah. maybe it's looking at you maybe it looks like it's looking into your soul yeah and and people think oh that bird's just so wise it's just waiting for a mouse to be scurry within its distance in the in the bird training world owls are not known to be super intelligent okay. they're much more react reactionary okay um you know they they react to stimuli they're very instinctual um they they're little mouse catching machines you know, that's, that's what they do. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, um, the, um, then there's a whole spectrum, you know, out there as far as the, you know, intelligence of yeah. birds. Well, just like mammals. I would just about imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yeah. Cool. There's what, about 10,000 species of birds out there. Oh, wow. So there's a, there's an enormous diversity of different species of and birds. So I wanted to talk to you about the dinosaur evolution then, sure. then too. So they are... They're they're kind of like a, they share a common ancestor pretty yeah. closely to to dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Yeah, and did so they did they evolve out of the were the dinosaurs the first step out of that reptilian 
So the 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 most commonly accepted theory mm. is that there was a clade of dinosaurs, a certain group of dinosaurs that essentially evolved feathers. And these these dinosaurs were tree climbing dinosaurs and they were finding some evolutionary advantage by jumping off of trees and gliding. Okay. Which was a Almost which like is a, a spine a, squirrel or... which is a precursor to flight. Okay. Right. And so these dinosaurs are doing that and eventually the mass extinctions are coming around, coming around and um, the Archaeopteryx, which is what uh, scientists would call the missing link okay. between, or the, 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 the missing link isn't missing anymore because there is this dinosaur with feathers that looks very much like a bird. Okay. And this guy shows up in the fossil record, I want to say 150 million years ago. I'd, okay. have to, I'd have to check that. Somebody's going to be pulling out their phone to, to prove me wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's right about there. And, and then from these dinosaurs evolve the birds. And the extinction event was 60 million years ago-ish? Is that... Uh, yeah. Well, let's see. Or 70. Okay. 60 or 70. That's right. what I thought. Yeah. So Archaeopteryx is quite a bit older than that. Okay. Um, if if I'm correct on that on that timeline, okay, um, so it's okay. I'm not gonna. <laughs> yeah. People can look get well, the number. You I'm can get a specific now. number on Wikipedia. <laughs> it's not a big deal as long as you know that. That's that's interesting though. I think uh, we 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 I guess um, mammals and 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 birds then share some type of reptilian ancestor. Is that? Kind of where, from what you understand, or you yeah. maybe maybe you haven't gone down the mammalian path. It's yeah. none of your business. <laughs> I don't want to say it's none of my business, but it's maybe just not my interest. Oh, okay. As far as um, what gets me excited about biology, um, you know, there is taxonomy mm -hmm. and how things are related from a okay. long, long time ago. Got it. Um, and that's obviously my interest. I'm right into that. And that you know, has been argued about for centuries. Yeah. And our understanding of it continues to evolve. And there's always the kind of the current, the current and best understanding. And where I come to that is I don't get caught too, caught up too much in it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got into science more to be an ecologist, okay. you know, to, to study about how nature works together now, the balance of, of kind of who eats who out there and how everything is interconnected. And so that's where all of my interest and study has been, um, whereas how things are related from millions of years ago is, is a little bit too theoretical for me to, um, to really, you know, um, fully, uh, I want to say grasp, but, but to, uh, essentially, um, for that to be my main focus. Yeah. It's almost the way I think about it then is, I guess, if you're looking at a fossil record versus working in a laboratory, being in the current environment is one step closer to the laboratory than going through the fossil record. I would just about imagine. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Um, so so Idaho and was was Idaho a unique place for birds of prey then prior to the the mm -hmm. the uh, Peregrine Fund? Sure. And obviously, like the being known for um, bringing back the Peregrine Falcon. Yes. So Idaho, and in particular the Snake River, um, which is you know. Um, has the highest density of nesting birds of prey in North America, the Snake River just south of Cuna, oh. um, which is currently the Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area. Okay. We, what we call as the NCA. Okay. And um, that area, the canyons of the Snake River, and then especially the plains above the Snake River where all the ground squirrels are, uh, there is such a high population of the Paiute ground squirrels. A lot of people call them whistle pigs. Mm -hmm. There's so many of them out there. And if there's a lot of prey, that leads to a lot of raptors. And um, what happens in this area, in the NCA, is that the raptors are nesting closer together there than anywhere else in North America. If there's, if there's an abundance of prey, the birds don't need to protect as large of a territory. 
and so their territories can be smaller, allowing their nests to fit closer together. Okay. And then if there's a lot of prey, when they're laying eggs, they'll lay more eggs, and they're, they'll get more young off successfully. And so if that's self-reinforcing by having such an enormous prey population, then that's why uh, you get an area that is so um, healthy for birds of prey. What do the uh, what do those ground squirrels eat? The ground squirrels are are um, seed eaters, okay. so they're they're eating uh, plant material and seeds. And uh, and is that where that DDT was initially entered into the bird population? Then do you think? So or? the DDT was ki- was killing insects. Okay. That's what it was designed for. Yeah. And so the squirrels are not necessarily insect eaters. Oh, okay. Um, but so the the DDT gets on the insects, and but a lot of birds are eating insects. Now so think they do about, both. Think about something like a robin, for example. Oh, okay. And then oh, okay. So the robin eats the insect, and then the falcon comes along and eats a bunch of robins. And so that's the how that DDT was getting into the falcons. That uh, that food uh, chain slash top predatory pyramid and the infiltration of chemicals and the con- the, the the concentration of chemicals is something that I learned about like I, quite a few years ago um, sure. when I was asking someone about the uh, about the mercury in tuna fish, and it's just extremely prevalent in the ocean, I guess, as well because of the. Uh, when you get a, a, a concentration of lower level um, animals that are getting exposed to chemicals, as you go up the food chain, the concentration actually goes up. Continues to go up because they're eating even more of the uh, of the chemicals in their prey. Right. Yeah. That's a that's a process called bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation. Yeah. Cool. And it's really it's really evident in birds of prey, which is one of the reasons that we that we study birds of prey. Um, you know, because they are such excellent indicators of overall environmental health. Um, toxins in the environment will concentrate in raptors. Uh, but if but if you think about it, who else is on top of the food chain out there? Yeah, we are. We are, exactly. Yeah. And so um, the, they are a great proxy for uh, the health of the environment. Now, what about, uh, I'm kind of curious about their senses. I had some questions about their senses yeah, because okay. I, I haven't, uh, I mean, I've heard, like years ago, you know, they talk about the the acuity of like a of like an eagle's eye. Uh, um, w- how acute is their vision? Do you have any like sure uh, layperson's ways of, of explaining that? So th- what what we see in birds of prey is a propensity of um, photoreceptors. Okay. In the fovea of the eye, so okay. that's the area of the retina where uh, the light concentrates. Okay. And um, we see about eight times more of the photoreceptors. Okay. Are, are, are we're which, talking cones then versus yeah, rods? Cones. Because rods are light sensing. Cones and, are and, color sensing. And the rods are more prevalent in the owls. Oh, okay. You know, so you'll see you'll see a, a higher a higher concentration of rods in the owls' eyes as compared to a diurnal raptor like a hawk or an eagle. Do and, do do uh, birds have the blind spot that we have in in their eyes as well with the with the the backwards with the, with the uh, um the the optical nerve running into the front of the eye and the mm-hmm. cones facing backwards? I'm not sure. Okay. Um but they do have two fovea areas where okay. that where that light concentrates so they have one kind of straight back and then they have one toward the inside. And so the way that that the raptors are perceiving the world is is more acute than we are. They have higher resolution. Uh, you know, so the resolution is the ability to see two things as distinct, um, you know, from a distance. And they, Okay, so in, so in so one have, eye, they have two fovea. Right. And so they have four fovea total. Yeah. Can they have? Can they possibly see in three dimensions through so, one eye? Then. So what I wonder is if they can focus in two different areas at the same time. Okay. Um, you know, forward and to the side, or or potentially even to the other side, and okay. how their brain is processing that image. <laughs> yeah. Again, I can't claim to know. Okay. Um, so, so we can look at you know morphologically how their eye is built, hmm. and we can draw inferences on how their brain perceives that. But it's hard to get a raptor to take an, a vision test, you know. Yeah. And uh, and to to see how how far exactly can they read a newspaper from? Yeah. Which, which I don't know. It's 
that would be interesting. I know. Uh, uh, so a lot of the psychology that I've read is they they use you know the the Skinner behaviorism to figure out different things in different animals, and a lot of times they'll use dogs because they're so easy to train. They can kind of figure out right. you know how sensitive their noses are and things like that. So <laughs> so with birds, it's just extremely difficult because of the. I suppose it'd be hard to get them into an MRI and <laughs> to right. hold still for a very long time and lay on their backs yeah. <laughs> and still be conscious. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. So they have two so they have two focal points in each eye. And right. then the resolution is roughly you would think like they have eight times as many cones. Right. So um so how far away can they spot uh do you have any rough estimate of I like, don't. you know, okay. Like a, a mouse on the ground. Yeah. You know, I think that depends a lot on atmospheric conditions. Mm. You know, I, I would think. Yeah. Miles. Dang. Um, that they could, that they could see movement, for example, and then they're going to approach and, and investigate. Um, but I, I don't have a good answer for exactly how far can they, you know, or detect something. And then mm. if that's going to be consistent from an eagle to a hawk yeah. to a falcon, um, which, you know, if you're looking at eagles and falcons, these these are two very, very different types of birds. Um, they're not really that closely related to each other. Okay. And uh, But they're both surviving on their ability to see, yeah. their ability to process information really quickly um, through their eyes. And so there's a, a very strong evolutionary pressure to have excellent eyesight, you know, um, which we see in both eagles and falcons. Do they have any other senses? Are, are there other examples of birds with, with senses that we don't necessarily so, so associate what, with? One of, one of my favorite senses is, is uh, the hearing in owls, for example. Oh, wow. You know, owls have the most sensitive hearing in the bird world. They can hear sounds that are about 10 decibels quieter than we can pick up. And if you think about it, an owl is so much smaller than we are. They don't have external ears. Uh, they just have essentially holes in the sides of their head. Mm-hmm. And yet they are able, many species of owl are able to localize sound to an awesome degree of accuracy, which allows them to be able to hunt in the absence of light or they're hunting mice sometimes under snow or under vegetation where they can't see at all. So they're just hunting sometimes only by hearing. Uh, what we've seen is that our external ears, what we think of just as a, the flaps on the side of our head, they allow us to localize sound in the vertical plane. Okay. Um, in the horizontal plane, our brain is calculating the time of arrival. So when a sound hits your ear, it goes into one ear first and then the other. There's also a difference in intensity, which allows us to detect if a sound's coming from the right or the oh, left. Oh, okay. But a sound coming from up or down, um, mammals are relying on their external ear. Uh, interesting experiment. Maybe you can do this with your student. If you put Play-Doh in the folds of the ear mm-hmm. and then you snap high and snap low, a person cannot tell you if it's coming from up or down because you've lost that ability to figure out if it's coming uh, where it's coming from in the vertical plane. So our ears are sensitive enough to be able to pick up the difference of a sound coming from slightly above us, just from the the from the flap fold from the, the flaps and folds in our ears. Yeah, okay. exactly. And that's learned. Our our brains learn that as we're when we're babies, and so owls don't have that. Birds don't have that. So birds in general don't have an excellent ability to localize where sound is coming from. Yeah, but owls do, and. In particular, the owls that have asymmetrical ears. So at oh, least, at least okay. four times in, in the history of owls, ear asymmetry has evolved. Um, so that's when one ear opens further lower in the head than the other. Okay. Or it could be that the ears are different sizes or the external meatus, which is the soft flap in the front of the ear that in the owl could be... Uh, could be offset such that they're picking up the sound differently in the vertical plane. So it's maybe arriving in the lower ear first and before it hits the upper ear. And therefore it gives the owl an excellent ability to figure out exactly where that sound is coming from. So they have the best 
hearing then? And so they have almost, they have excellent that, hearing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I try to stay away with from superlatives okay. when I'm describing nature. Yeah. Because uh, you never know what kind of surprises people well, there's discover. Just, yeah. There's lots of bests out there. Mm. There's lots of amazing things out there. Mm-hmm. And, and it's hard for me to say what's best. Okay. But I do believe they have the most sensitive hearing in the bird world. Yeah. Um, there are also oil birds out there that echolocate. Um, it's a kind oh, okay. of a rudimentary form of echolocation, you know, where they're making a click and listen for listening for it back. That's a that's a cave roosting bird, um, and that's that's more typical of the bats. Okay, so they're in the same type of environment, and therefore they kind of evolved similar. Yeah, the ability to make a sound and listen for it back, and and then and then their brain processes some sort of a visual map. Yeah, they actually. Um, I uh, watched a no, no, no. I I listened to some sort of podcast or documentary about uh, a blind guy that learned how to echolocate. And so they, they actually put him into an MRI and wow. um, they found out that when you, when blind people learn how to echolocate, their visual cortex lights up. And mm. so it's basically as strong as peripheral vision, but you have to be able to, you have to have practice in yeah. order to be able to do that. But it, it's it's the visual cortex that lights up when the echolocation is happening. So interesting, yeah, super cool stuff. Um, I you was... know, well, one of, another sensory um, capability in birds um, is um, their ability to migrate. And one oh. of the things that we see in in birds that's always fascinated me is, you know, you have so many birds that that go um, from from here. They'll go south typically um, in the in the fall, and the juvenile birds oftentimes will go before the adults go. So it's not so much learned as innate. Huh. So there's some sense that these birds have it's time to go. And and, and, and the young birds go before the adults. And do they even before they know where they're headed almost? Right. Or, or they, they just, just go. Know? They just wow. go there. Which is So yeah, they're born is, and then they know they're supposed to go to some location. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, and we see that. And then uh, it's interesting, like if you look into the history of the whooping crane, for example, which is a migratory bird that was down to, um, you know, the last few individuals and then is, has been brought back more recently. And the birds that are coming back are not migrating, you know, so sometimes there could be some disconnect there. You'd think that they would if it were innate, if it were completely innate. Yeah. Right. But there's there's more going on there. I was going to ask you about bird songs, too. Yeah, Cause sure. I read on your profile that that's one of the things that you studied it, is, is that, uh, what are some of the reasons for, for birds singing so and birds it, are, singing? do they have, do they have a much more complicated communication system than we've yet been able to decode if this migration thing is a. Right. So, so birds, bird singing has been, uh, studied for a long time Okay. and the most common reason that a bird is singing is for territorial defense and mate attraction which are kind of the somewhat the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have male birds are typically the ones with the song, and the males um, are the ones that are also defending the territory. And oftentimes the female is attracted either to the song, very like a strong, robust song, or is attracted to the territory that the male has set up. So the male has maybe the best, you know, Habitat. Okay. And most resources and available. The, and the reason that he has it is because his song is strong enough that he's able to push the other males further away. You know, with his with his song as he goes around his territory and sings from different perches. And so the females welcomed into that territory. Hmm. Um, and so if you think about it, what a great way to settle disputes. Yeah. You know, or, or to, uh, you know, imagine if we were just all out there singing at the border of our neighbor's houses. And if you're a better singer, you get part of their yard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's kind of, kind of similar to what's happening in the bird world. This is sing, sing for your ownership. <laughs> right. Uh, and those that can't sing, oh man, they don't get, they don't get much. Huh. And, and is there, is there any other ways, how else do they communicate then? I'm I'm curious if like social birds. Sure. So I mean, there's there's birds are communicating in all kinds of ways. Um, one of the ways is is through feathers, and uh, like if you think about hummingbirds, for example, and they have iridescent feathers and 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 different different um, signals that they can give through their feathers. 
Um, you, and then I think about birds, even birds of prey, like harpy eagles, for example, or, or the crested eagles. And this is happening, I think, with all birds, is that they can, through a different posture and a, the different way that they hold their feathers, or with the harpy eagle and their crest on the top, you know, they are they are making a definite signal to either the same species, even to maybe even other species. It's a, it's a complicated word, world out there. Yeah, and I, that would make sense that a lot of it would be visual then too. Yeah. If their eyesight is so acute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about a con- conservation um, area because I had a, I told a friend that you were coming on um, and uh, she had said that she was at a residence and uh, with someone and they decided to make their house a natural conservation area for a specific type of bird and then like between the time of her living there and then her moving out it was now a hmm. conservation area for that bird are okay. you are you do you have any expertise in that area no okay not necessarily now you can get your yard certified as habitat as excellent habitat I'm trying to think of the uh, of the entity that does that. You know, it's a nonprofit conservation group that you know um, that does that um, certified backyard habitat. I think. Okay. Um, now, if there is a national conservation area, is something very specific that okay. is that is uh, you know done by the federal government. Okay. Um, and. I don't think you can just have your yard certified. Okay, so it's like, a different thing in that way. Okay, it, it it sounds to me like it's a different thing. You know, I'd like to I'd like to learn more about that, and I think that, um, you know, that's a little bit what I was talking about earlier is that we can all make our make our own little, um, you know, pieces of habitat uh, better for birds without too much trouble. And, and then there are entities that will certify that. I, I don't know exactly what that entails, though. And what, happen, what happens with the national level, then? How does... It... So at the national level, it, it, it will involve typically protection of the land in perpetuity. And so, um, for example, the Morley Nelson Snake River Birds of Prey National Conservation Area, that's mm-hmm. a half a million acres along the Snake River that we talked about earlier. Um, that area is recognized for its importance to raptors and therefore will be, has a higher level, the land has a higher level of protection. What humans can do in that land, uh, before we do anything, we need to consult the birds. Is this going to be good for the birds? Is it going to be bad for the birds? Um, and sometimes it gets, um, it gets a little bit complicated, sometimes controversial because, uh, sometimes there's some sort of human activity that's proposed in that land that uh, is not going to be maybe as easy to do if it were not, um, you know, kind of uh, designated as a conservation area. So, so a lot of times there will be pushes by rural communities in particular to not tie up their backyard with this designation because they don't want to be... Um, they don't want what they can do on the land to be curtailed. Typically, it'd be public land though in the first place. Okay. So rat- and Idaho has a ton of. So yeah, Idaho land. Has, a, has a ton of public land. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, yeah. The ethics on that is has got to be really really interesting. Yeah, has, do you, is it getting is it getting easier as time goes on to be, or is it just different problems? I wouldn't <laughs> say it, I wouldn't say it's getting easier. Okay. Um, y- you know the. Um, there, there was just recently, um, you know, a push to look at a lot of protected land in the West and to roll back some of those protections, especially, you know, like a grand, grand scare, staircase escalante um, uh, and, and, the, and also the Bears Ears National Monument. Um, those are both areas in Utah that were the, the acreage of them were significantly reduced just recently. And, you know, there was there's people on both sides of that argument. And uh, in the current political climate, it's difficult to get uh, land uh, designated as a conservation area. Okay. And, and I, don't, I guess we don't have to get too much into the, the politics on, on that one because I can just about imagine where that, <laughs> where that lies. Um, I wanted to ask you just 
Um, I asked you about the bird singing. Um, I wanted to ask you about, like, do you have any stories about about birds that you think are extremely interesting that you'd like to share? Maybe something, I'm sure you were out on the field doing some research at some hmm. juncture. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I've so I studied birds for a long time, um, maybe about 10 years in the field. I worked as a, as a field biologist um, studying various birds. And one, what does a day look like when you're doing that? Well, it, it, that really depends. Um, so one time I was working as a, a parrot researcher in the Amazon oh, uh, wow. in South America, and I was in Peru. And my task was to walk these transects through the forest, look for parrots, and there were about 16 different species of parrots in this forest and then determine what they were eating. And if I couldn't identify exactly the fruit that they were eating then or the seed, then I would just put some flagging on the tree to come back and find it later. Um, because I wasn't super knowledgeable in this area. And so I was going... Well, this is how you get knowledge, though, right? <laughs> right. So I was going through and, uh, and looking for parrots and, and finding them. And, uh, and then right out of the, you know, off the, off the forest floor big, large, gray and black bird. And I could hear, I just remember to this day hearing the sound of those wings as this giant bird picked up off the ground and it disappeared. And I looked at myself and I said, I think that was a harpy eagle. A harpy eagle is the, is the largest and most powerful eagle in the world. And uh, ex- exceedingly rare. And, and of course I had never seen one. And so what I did was I took a compass bearing, I had a compass on me, and uh, this was Hot, late afternoon, three thirty, four o'clock. You can hear the cicadas all around. And I take this compass bearing and I follow, I just start walking off into the woods. And um, I had been previously on a trail, on a transect that we had set up. And I went off the transect and I just kept walking and I was about to give up when I finally saw him. And I, and I recall this harpy eagle, you know, they're, they are an enormously powerful bird and he was not too far above me and he turns around and looks right at me and I remember I just sketched him you know just like naturalists of old uh, sketching what you see out in the field and and uh, and writing down the, some of the field field marks I'm seeing on this bird and and I followed him for about the next hour and he was kind of foraging a little bit I kind of saw him you know like following this this you know, some of these ground birds that were kind of scurrying around so much life out there in the Amazon rainforest. And finally I decided I needed to get back. It was so hot. My, my glasses were all fogged up and I couldn't hardly wear my glasses because I couldn't get them to unfog. How hot was it? I mean, it's oh, right on I the mean, equator, it, right? It, yeah. It's, it was probably 85 or 90 degrees oh. with about a hundred percent humidity. Right on. Um, and, um, and so I, I took a compass bearing to go back to the trail and I, and the compass was stuck. Every direction I looked in this compass uh, was the same. The, the, the needle wasn't spinning anymore. And I figured that the needle may have not been spinning for a while. <laughs> and so I promptly got myself exceedingly lost. You know, I haven't been lost that many times in my life where I really just did not know what way is what. Um, you know, it, it was an overcast day. I wasn't getting much you know, direction from where the sun was coming from. There was no hills. There was just forest every direction wow. and, and real thick. And I had a machete and I had a little bit of water and I was, I'd walk, you know, 50 yards and put up some flagging. And then I'd walk 50 yards another direction, put up some flagging. And I was trying to like essentially make a map for myself to find my way out. Even got to the point of just calling out, Help, are you that me? Nice. <laughs> and I was just this lost American kid out there in the Amazon. And uh, so I'll never forget that uh, encounter with the harpy eagle. I- eventually, I found my way to the trail. And, uh, and then I got back to the, to the camp, the research camp I was at after dark. And, uh, you know, people were wondering where I was. And, I and said, you were wondering <laughs> where you were. <laughs> and I said, Aguila Arpia. And they couldn't believe it because I'd seen a harpy eagle and no one had seen one there for some time. How much time did you spend in the Amazon rainforest? Oh, a little bit less than a year altogether okay. in, in two different stints, one in, in uh, Peru and one in Ecuador. And is that uh, normal for people that go into your to your field? I to... don't know that if it's normal, but um, one of the things that 
when you start studying birds in particular, but ecology in general, really quickly you start the, the tropics are introduced to you. And there's so much more diversity of animals and plants in the tropics as compared to in temperate regions like where we are in Idaho. And so uh, you start reading the books about the tropics. A Neotropical Companion is, is one of the books that I had read, and I was like, I've got to go see these things. Um, the country of Ecuador, I believe there's about 2,000 species of birds uh, the, in the country of Ecuador. Um, in all of North America, including Canada and the United States, I think the total is around 800. You know, oh. Ecuador is size of Idaho. Yeah. Um, wow. It, it, maybe it's a little bit. I have to. I would think it's about that. Uh, I'd have to check on that. Um, but to think about that many more species crammed into the area, um, so, so fascinating. So so yeah, I started going down to Mexico. And I spent some time in the tropics in Mexico and then in, in, in uh, South America as well. And all that all that water, I suppose, helps breed biodiversity along with the, the trees and the plant life. Right. And, and, and the eleva- ten, tons and, of cal- uh, calories available. For- the elevation changes, too. So if you have, you know, the Amazon rainforest, this lowland rainforest, and then you go up to 17,000 feet in the Andes, oh. and then you go right back down to the Pacific coast, that just that's just, there's such a diversity of climates and habitats. And um, when you were there, were you just were you in like a tent for a lot of the time? No, I, I was staying. I was staying at, at a research lodge, and okay. the research lodge was uh, connected with uh, with a tourist facility, and okay. so that that's kind of a a neat way that people can you know get involved with conservation. You can look you can look for these um, eco lodges, for example, places where they are doing research. Um, they're studying the studying the rainforest and. Um, and then people can stay there too. So part of my job was to also give presentations to the general public about oh. what we were doing. So that's that's kind of how they're paying for the the whole endeavor. I would just about guess then. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's super. Yeah. Cool. It's, it's a it's a it's a model for economic vitality too, uh, for sure. That's cool. If, if it's done right. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting to me that you were down and I want to go down to South America so badly. I was just in, in Mexico and uh, uh, in like the tropical region down there ish, <laughs> uh, Puerto Vallarta, you know, it's more of a tourist That's area, tropical-ish. but it's, tro- it was, it yeah, was there's definitely a lot of great birds down there. Yeah. And there was a, uh, yeah, ton of, I mean, the whole town is just right on the coast and then it's jungle as soon as you go to immediately right. to your, to your East. But, uh, mm-hmm. but I just, I, all those trees. And then we went through a hike in, in one of those areas and it was, it was pretty amazing to see all the, all the different, uh, life that was just flourishing everywhere right. until we saw a spider that was about, you know, the size of your hand. Yeah. And then it was kind of like, well, maybe we don't want to keep going too deep into this <laughs> right? because <laughs> we don't know if it's poisonous or not, but something about a spider that's that huge while you're cr- climbing over, around on rocks yeah, in, the, I, in a I creek. Try to, I try to give the spiders <laughs> and the snakes a, a nice wide berth. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more fearful of the, of the, uh, feral dogs though. I really? Was, I was hiking outside of Zihuatanejo okay. and I was trying to trying to hike up this this mountain that you kind of see on the skyline there and I was just hiking up there and walking up this this path and birding my way up there by myself and I got attacked by a pack of dogs. Oh wow. And it was you, you got know, attacked by a pack of dogs. Yeah. They came wow. they came after me and I was, you know, picking up rocks and swinging and I mean it was like I I wasn't able to back out of the situation calmly and not make eye contact. It was like, okay, I'm in a dog fight right now. Wow. And uh and then I will never forget this old lady came out with a broom. And that was it. <laughs> and she just started banging on the broom and she came out and the dogs all ran away. <laughs> and uh yeah. I was like, okay, I'm not going up this road any further. Wow. I didn't know feral dogs attack people. That's, uh, you know, I don't know that they always do, hmm. but they, but feral dogs are pretty dangerous. I suppose you know, they and, might have been territorial. And, you know, they may also not have all been, you know, totally feral. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a lot of, um, you know, there's a wild dog population in a lot of the developing world. Um, but some of the dogs presumably belong to somebody, you know, and I yeah. was close to their house and, you know, my dog barks at people when they 
walk by. Yeah. And if there's, you know, if, if that dog can approach the person that's walking by and then other dogs in the area all kind of join in, I think that's the situation I found myself in. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of wild when you do run into, I mean, I saw some, some, not when I was on that hot hike, but I saw some feral dogs in the area and it's just <laughs> a different thing. Cause you don't right. see those here really. Yeah. And, and you know, birds for me, and all, and really all of my adult life have been a way to kind of seek modern adventure, you know? So I want to go, I want to go down this dirt road in Mexico and try to climb this hill because I was out there looking for birds, mm -hmm. you know, and that, that'll get you into all kinds of situations, sometimes, sometimes dangerous, but most of the time they just lead you to really uh, beautiful places and, and, and meet really interesting people and the, you know, the, the richness that that brings to your life. Um, to me, I credit birds with so much of that. That's cool. I think that's actually a good place to end because we're at an hour. Okay. <laughs> Very well, well said. Um, so here in the, in the Valley, you probably recommend people seek adventure. I'm guessing along the snake river. Yeah. On that, some of those hiking that's trails. That's an way up in the foothills. Um, you know, the Intermountain Bird Observatory uh, runs a banding station on the Boise River. That's where they're studying bird migration uh, and also up on Lucky Peak. Of course, where we are in, in, in South Boise at the World Center for Birds of Prey, we, uh, we, try to bring, we try to bring the world of raptors in particular to people, make it accessible to anyone to come up and, and, and learn more about these creatures and then also uh, to see them up close and to, you know, hopefully seed that adventure in their own lives. Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on today and thanks for all you do. Yeah. And uh, we'll chat again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me.